Hi, I'm Mary Lyons, the Wealth Woman. I'm Eric Alexander with Benchmark Income Group. Welcome to the Big Wealth Podcast. So we are beside ourselves, so excited, so in, giddy. In, giddy is the right word for it. This is something that we've been thinking about for two, three, four years now, I think. Uh, but we get a chance to sit down with sort of a fanboy version of mine, right? In Morgan le- Cron. Maybe let's call him a legend. <laughs> legend. That's probably the better way to put it. You can call yourself a fanboy. That's fine. <laughs> but talking about this idea of Enneagram and finance, and one of the things we've seen over and over again is mindset beats strategy, beats systems, beat tools. And the mindset piece of it is the thing that can wreck everything. It's and the most important part. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the idea that Mary and I had been walking through for a long time is how do we help people get a handle on what their how they make decisions so that they don't screw up the rest of their lives uh, or at least their finance. They can screw up the rest of it on their own. But so we're so excited to have you here. I'm just giddy about. So welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. You may want to say that who I am by name. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is probably true. So Ian Morgan Cron, who wrote The Road Back to You, you've got a brand new one that just came out. I just finished it. Um, the story of you, and then a bunch of other ones. Something about CIA, but I don't. I have not read that one yet. <laughs> yes, I have two others in addition to those. Yeah. So we're so excited to have you on this and uh, kind of walking through it. And if I remember, today is really about what is Enneagram and. How does that present? Yeah, well, first of all, I'm delighted to be on your podcast and to be talking about personality and finances. All of us have very different ways of seeing the world. And I think that there we underestimate the influence of personality on decision making and obviously on things like finances and how we view wealth building. Right. So for those who don't know, the Enneagram is an ancient personality typing system that teaches there are nine basic personality styles in the world, one of which we gravitate toward and adopt in childhood as a way to feel safe, uh, to protect ourselves and to navigate the new world of relationships in which we suddenly find ourselves Mm -hmm. as little people. And each of those nine types, and this is super important has an unconscious motivation that powerfully influences how that type habitually and predictably acts, Hmm. thinks, and feels from moment to moment on a daily basis. I think human beings tend to think that they are in more control of their lives. Than we actually are. Than we actually are. For example, we have no control over the sound of that ambulance (laughs) passing (laughs) passing the studio right now. What could go wrong? Right. Right. By way of analogy, (laughs) uh, there are things operating in our unconscious that powerfully influence us without our knowing it. So one of the beautiful things about the Enneagram is it doesn't just tell you what you do. It tells you why you do it. So that's very different from... Myers-Briggs, Colby, Hogan, Strengths Finder, DISC, any of these instruments, which I'm all in favor of people using. I love anything that helps people develop self-awareness. But I think the Enneagram is special because what it reveals is our motivations, hidden drivers, so that we can develop self-awareness and recognize when forces that usually live just beyond the fence line of awareness are exerting or influence over so we can make different choices than some of the unhealthy ones we make when we don't have that information. Yeah, we spend a lot of time talking about living a life of design instead of a life of default. And I think Mm -hmm. when you don't have self-awareness, what you get is default. Mm -hmm. All your decisions happen almost in a reactionary space. Whereas when you have self-awareness and you understand what your motivators are, you can actually question your motivation at times. And I think that helps move people from a space of unhealthiness to healthiness. And I personally, I am obsessed with personality assessments in part because (laughs) I think dealing with people was not a natural inclination for me. My brother was very naturally gifted with other humans, still is. He's the type of person that walks into a room and everyone's like, oh, John, and they gravitate towards him, very social, even growing up. And I can see some of this dynamic happening with my own kids too. When people would come over to the house, my friends would come over and end up playing with him because Mm. he's just a lot more fun than I am. Let's like, I, I can 
put that out there. But learning how to interact with other people and understand their motivations was something that I actually had to study to become good at it. And so for me, I'm just excited that you're here because I'm just yeah. going to soak up all of this knowledge. So thank you for well, being yeah. here with us. I'm yeah, delighted. Absolutely. We've talked about that before, this idea of the elephant and the rider, that the rider really thinks that they're in control of what's going on. And they think they're kind of steering the ship and the elephant's like, yeah, you've, you have no clue. Yeah. Yes, that's absolutely true. And again, this idea of self-awareness is so important. The Cornell University a bunch of years ago did a study in which they – looked at the lives of 72 high-performing CEOs of companies ranging in value from $5 million to $5 billion. And they wanted to figure out what was the secret sauce that made these 72 CEOs so successful. And at the end of the study, the researchers revealed that they were even surprised at the result. Mm. And here's the line from the study. It was, the key predictor of success is self-awareness. Mm. So it wasn't grit. It wasn't strategic planning. It wasn't all the things that we tend to think it would be right. for that. It was a soft skill. And the soft skill was the capacity to monitor and regulate the way that we move through the world. Hmm. And that's self-awareness. And that applies, obviously, to decision-making and self-awareness around finances and why do I make these decisions? Why do I have these fears? Why, you know, why? Mm -hmm. Because some of them are not operating in your best interests. So you want to be able to right. see them and head them off at the pass so that you can make much better decisions. Yeah, that idea of the regulation is a big deal, right? Because mm -hmm. I can see it happening, but if I don't know how to fix it. Yes, I'm just along for the ride. So we're going to talk about Enneagram 5s. These, there are nine types to right. help people remember that. And I'll describe them during this episode very briefly. But fives tend to be reserved, very private. Right. And they're sensitive to people getting in their personal space. For sure. Okay. So I know, having knowing this material, that when I meet you, right. I'm going to give you more physical space. Like oh. I am, and I'm not going to start asking you very personal questions off the bat. Right. Now, if an Enneagram 2, this will make sense in a moment, I can hug them. I can be very tactile with them. Right. I can ask them immediately, like, how are you feeling? How was your trip? Tell me, you've got three kids. Now, a five hears that so differently than a two. Sure. And because I know that, I have so much less relational friction in my world. Oh. And it removes inefficiencies. And it's also, dare I say, a way of honoring and respecting the way another person sees and moves through the world. It's almost like a shortcut. It definitely is. Yeah. That's interesting. I think one of the things that I want to know as we jump into this and you start describing the types is how do you identify someone's Enneagram type within the first five minutes of meeting them? So that you know whether you should be asking those questions, giving them a hug, giving them space. If, if there are tips or tricks, certain things that stand out, I'd love to hear what those are. You really have to know the Enneagram first. I have studied the Enneagram for years and years. I try to hold my assumptions very lightly, hmm. really lightly, uh, because I can be wrong. Why? People are not made of glass. I can't see into your sure. unconscious <laughs> motivation. Now, if I spent more time with you, it would become increasingly clear. But even then, I'm like, I suspect this person is a X. Right. But I, if you do it long enough, you begin to pick up on things, patterns, like clothing choices. Uh, interestingly, haircut choices. And we can even talk about some of this body language. You know, human beings have energies. Sure. And mm -hmm. that's not a new age idea. If we weren't able to pick up on energies 20,000 years ago, you'd have been dead on the Serengeti. You'd be like, <laughs> oh, if you didn't know lion, not good, bad energy, right. you'd be dead. Right. And so people do give off certain energies. You were talking about your brother earlier. People walk in the house. They naturally gravitate toward him. They're unconsciously picking up on a friendly, outgoing, extroverted, what we would call an open to experience person. And they're like, immediately that energy is yeah. inviting. Yeah. There are other types. The energy is not as inviting. Right. doesn't mean that they're not relational. It just might take a little bit more time to move past the boundary, the psychological boundary that person has erected toward other people. 
Yeah. I remember there was a great book, uh, I think Susan Cain, The Power of Quiet. Yes. And she talked about this idea that the introverts and the extroverts, their path for getting into that, that data is different. The extrovert wants to go small talk to figure out whether you're worth having the longer, deeper conversation. Whereas the introverts are like, I'm not sure I'm going to waste my time on how's the weather until I know how deep I can get with you. Yes. And, and so by the way, Susan's on my podcast next month. So it's oh, so oh, oh, her up. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking forward That's to it. That's a great book. I always find it fascinating. All your books start with eight yeah. and go the other way around. And my theory on that is That's that. That's because the eights are control freaks and we want to know about <laughs> ourselves. I know. Yeah, I can or say an that because like, I know. I'm not reading to the end of the book. I've got to have my stuff up front. <laughs> but that's my theory on why it's always first. But Actually, the reason is that the Enneagram breaks the numbers down into what we call triads. So eight, nines, and ones are in what we call the anger. Twos, threes, and fours are in the heart triad or the sometimes the shame triad and five, sixes, and sevens are in the fear or head triad. So when you write a book, you don't want to go from one to two because you just split up two triads. Oh, right. mm. I want people to see the relationship of the, between the three types in each triad. So yeah. Then start us off wherever you think makes most sense on that side. Well, oddly enough, I'm going to start with ones. Oh. Uh, just <laughs> right. for our sake. It doesn't really matter when I do quick right. overviews, right? He's going to make me wait. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so Mary's an eight for those of you. That's right. Um, all right. So ones are called the improvers. They used to be called the perfectionists. But I had more emails from ones saying, why is my number the only one with a, a signifier that sounds negative? Mm. So uh -huh. I was like, you're right. So let's go with improver because that's actually the one superpower. These are people who are meticulous. They're ethical. They're detailed. And I would use the phrase morally heroic, right? Mm. There's so much integrity with ones. Here's the unconscious motivation. The one is motivated by a need to be good to be appropriate, to be virtuous, to avoid making mistakes, and they have a need to be right, okay? And I love ones, and I think we should say from the outset that we in our personalities can be operating at a very healthy level or in an unhealthy level. Another way to say that might be highly self-aware level and low self-awareness, right? Mm -hmm. Going through Life right. in default yeah. instead of with intentionality. So twos, they're called the helpers. They're warm, they're caring, they're giving, they're supportive, generous, self-sacrificing. These folks are motivated, this is so simple, by a need to be liked. Now, all of us want to be liked on the most part, I think. Twos really want to be liked. These are people who want to be appreciated. They want to be wanted they want to be needed by other people. So it, it makes sense then that their strategy for winning appreciation and right. approval is through acts of service. Right? That's their love language, so to speak. It's their love language. Sometimes it's what I would call a calculated giving because mm. there's this kind of, if I help you, you will love me and you will meet my needs without my having to come out directly and ask for them. Mind reading-ish? They are mind readers. Twos are almost psychic in their ability to read, what is it you want, what is it you need, and how can I meet those needs? So I think my son, who is seven, is a two. <laughs> I'm almost 100% sure, sure. Because from the time he was teeny, teeny, tiny, he just seems to know what other people need and want in order to feel comfortable. And he is happy to give it to him. Mm. And we've had the past two years, so his first grade teacher and now his second grade teacher have both sent us emails saying, your child is very like centered in himself and helps other people overcome their insecurities and pulls them into the group mm -hmm. so that they have someone to play with. And he like helps regulate the classroom because it's what the teacher wants. Yes. I mean, it's, it's, it Aww. is uncanny, his ability to figure out in any given moment exactly what the person across from him needs right. to just come to a place of being centered and calm right. and content. Right. So it, if, it's almost magical. I mean, I, I watch him and I'm like, this is it's an inherent skill. It, I, he didn't learn it from me. I could say that. <laughs> so it's it's amazing to watch. And so when they're self-aware, that giving is altruistic. Mm -hmm. There's no strings attached. When they're uh, unhealthy. It's to get something right. There's a quid pro quo. Yeah. Mm. And it's very subtle. Mm -hmm. And what they're wanting in return is this expressions of appreciation. 
Uh, like I always say, if you want to give a uh, Enneagram to a, what I call a hit of pleasure, all you have to say to them is, I don't know what I could do, I would do without you. I mean, just the two Indispensable. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, but sometimes their giving is indiscriminate. It's just all over the place. It's just they don't oh. stop if mm-hmm. they're not very self-aware. Because they get depleted at that point. No, it's not so much that the twos rarely get depleted. They just can spend days with people and just get – the more time they're with people, the more energy they get. Oh, okay. You're precisely the opposite yeah, as a yeah, five. Sure. That'll yeah. make sense in a moment. Threes. Let's go to threes, okay? The performers. Success-oriented, image-conscious, wired for productivity. These are people who have memorized David Allen's book, Getting Things Done. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And they're motivated by a need to succeed succeed, to appear successful, and to avoid failure at all costs. Now, let me just show you the difference between a two and a three, because they're in the same triad, twos, threes, and fours. Okay. A two wants appreciation. A three wants admiration. That's a very different animal, okay? And I don't know what we would do without threes. My The guy who runs my company, Lance, who you guys know, is a three. And I just trust – he just gets stuff done. You can tell that within the first five minutes of meeting him too. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. There, he's <laughs> highly efficient, right? Efficiency is a very important thing to threes. Like how do we get from A to Z in the straightest line possible, watching for opportunities – leveraging them, right? And he just sees things I would never see. Like he just sees a world of possibilities. Yeah. I have gifts that are different. We'll get to that actually next. Next, right, yeah. That makes us really good coworkers. But does that make him tenacious too because he'll just chase it down? Oh, throw a bone, baby. Yeah, (laughs) he'll knock it out. Or actually, if you want to motivate a three, you want to, number one, give them measurable benchmarks to hit measurable targets to hit. You want to, I don't want to say dangle, that sounds too manipulative, but for lack of a better word in the moment, promotions, dangle things like bonuses, new titles, because they chase carrots hard and they get the carrot unlike other people, you know? So it's- Well, there was, what was the famous Napoleon quote? He's dangling at a medal and you can get anybody to do anything you want and attack and defend and whatever for this little- Right. Shiny piece of metal. Yeah. Right. Well, particularly for threes. Yeah. Now, mm-hmm. fours are called the romantics. It's interesting with romantics. We think there are more sixes on the Enneagram than any other type, and I'll explain them in a moment, and fewer fours in the general population than any other type. These are people who are creative, they're sensitive, they're moody, disproportionately represented in the creative arts. Mm. They're motivated by a need to be special and unique to compensate for what they perceive as a missing piece in their essential makeup. Like they're unworthy, maybe? Or? Yes. Yeah. Unworthy of love and relationship. Okay. So you'll notice, by the way, as you describe these types, some people will say, gosh, they, there sounds like there's so much negativity involved. You know what I mean? Like, like this emo is, kind of. Yeah. It's like you're being very hard on people. And I always tell people, look, if you want to mess with the Enneagram, don't expect to be flattered. Right. <laughs> because in the beginning, it's going to say to you, that what's best about you is what's worst about you, and what's worst about you is what's best about you. And it's easier for people to nail their type when you talk about what they're like not at their best. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh, it. you're reading my mail. It becomes mail. obvious. Yeah, it becomes yeah. a lot more obvious. So we don't have time today. I'd say that every type in its healthiest expression is incredibly wonderful. Every right. single one. When To the degree now, as they go down, as the curve goes down toward lacking (laughs) self-awareness, then that's when they increasingly bang guardrail to guardrail through people's lives. That's where stuff can go sideways. Yeah. So the positive of four is the creativity? Oh, yeah. When a four is very healthy, they are... Not Twos are exquisitely attuned to other people's feelings, and fours are exquisitely attuned to their own. Okay. So they actually begin to get out of themselves to be fours are called a self-referential number because they twos are called an other referential number because they're externally focused on others whereas fours are much more inwardly focused and think amy winehouse (laughs) think about the great artists who have been so in touch with their own feelings and their own internal world that they're able to then express it in such a way that it touches and moves other people very powerfully Mm -hmm. right 
but they're the most complicated, complex number on the Enneagram. You know, just when you think you've gotten to the bottom of a four, you realize, oh, no, there is no bottom. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Just going. Yeah. And I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry, Mary. No, you're good. Fives. You ready? Yeah. All right. They're, you guys are <laughs> called the investigators, yeah. right? Most analytical number on the Enneagram. They are detached. Sometimes they're loners or they appear to be loners. They're very private people. And they're motivated by a need to gain knowledge as a way to fend off feelings of incompetency. They are concerned about conserving energy, particularly in the relational sphere. So I oftentimes tell people that handshakes, an unexpected run-in with somebody or a call, phone call, it just costs them more than it does other types. Yes. Right? Yeah. It's draining to them. It doesn't mean that they don't love people. It just means they only have so much relational energy in, in yeah. any given day. And in order to recover that energy, they have to spend time alone. They're very private people. And two of my best friends are fives. I have a very special affection for them. But they're, especially in the relational sphere, they are the most misunderstood of all numbers. Probably a little awkward. Can be. I might, so I'm a five, and my, my running joke is that people are like going to the gym. I don't look forward to going to the gym. It, I find it draining on the front end. But when I go to the gym, I'm always glad I was there. But then I'm tired mm -hmm. on the other end of it. Yes. So. Yes, I completely understand that if you're a five. They also are very, very concerned with self-sufficiency and mm. with trying to avoid being overly reliant on other people. So that's going to be really interesting when we start to talk about these types and like and finances. Money, yeah. What's going to influence a five? Self-sufficiency, autonomy, and independence. And that is going to really affect the way they think about wealth building and thinking about, for example, retirement. Mm -hmm. Will I have enough? Are, is there a um, correlation between having a five Enneagram type and being introverted or extroverted? Do you ever see extremely extroverted fives? Mm. Uh, typically introverted and reserved. And they are, oftentimes we say that fives are like, when they're not very healthy, are like brains walking on a stick, mm -hmm. uh, like a lollipop, because they're not actually even... Can I call you that, the, Eric? Oh, Brain uh, on a stick? Yeah. That might be Just connected into your body. It makes total <laughs> sense, right? Yeah. Uh, you don't have it very badly. No. You're not. You're fairly warm, and that's at least how I've experienced you yeah. in our time together. Uh, but, but it's learned. It's not natural. Right. So if you were a two, the helper, you would be gaining energy from this interaction right now. You would just be so excited to be with two new people. Sevens yeah. would have that. We'll talk about them in a minute. Would have the same experience. Yeah. This requires you to burn more calories. For sure. And if you know that, for example— But in I, a cool way because of the knowledge gain. Yes. Like it's worth the—for me, it's worth the trade-off. Oh, Does that make yeah, sense? Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. You ready for sixes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. We think there are more sixes than any other type on the Enneagram in the general population. Interesting. This is all speculative, but I think it's probably true. Uh, they're called the loyalists. And these people are committed. They're practical. They're earthy. I think they're the wittiest number on the Enneagram. And they are worst case, worst case scenario thinkers who are motivated by fear and the need for security, for certitude, for safety and support, right? Guidance from others. Of sevens are called the enthusiasts. These are the joy bombs of the Enneagram, right? They're fun. They're spontaneous. They're adventurous. They're always thinking about a future filled with unlimited possibilities, right? And they're motivated by a need to be happy, to plan stimulating experiences. And all of this is in, in service to wanting to avoid emotional, psychological, and circumstantial pain and distress. These are people who are Deeply motivated by a need to avoid deprivation, being deprived of an opportunity or a yes, or experiences, right? So you don't have a number that want, has FOMO any more than a seven. <laughs> oh, got it. <laughs> right? The, that's the fear of deprivation that you can see from the outside. Eights are called the challengers. And these are amazing people. These are larger than life presences. They're commanding. They're intense. They can be confrontational. They can be intimidating to other people because 
they have so much passion and intensity, it radiates off them a bit like anger. So there's a high threat level sometimes when you're around an eight. They're <laughs> motivated by a need to assert control and power over others in the environment in order to mask tenderness and vulnerability. So they're very defended. And that defendedness comes off as sometimes as brusqueness or aggression. But it's not like a mask, like a three? No, great question. So threes have this chameleon-like ability, right, to project an image that will match what they perceive are the expectations of the crowd, right? Mm. So make great salespeople for that reason, right? They can come into a room, read the room instantly and say, who do I have to become to make you admire me? Mm. Now, when a two walks into a room, they usually read an individual mm. and Not they'll the say, what do I have to do to make you appreciate me? But both project masks. Sure. They're just different. Fours will project a mask. The twos, threes, and fours are the most image conscious numbers on the Enneagram. So they all project masks that are different for different reasons. But the eight doesn't have that. It's more about protection. No, no eights it, don't wear masks. It's the best The best defense is a good offense. Yes. Uh. Yes. And they eights actually are very suspicious of people that they sense are wearing masks. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. They are not naturally trusting. Yep. And they have a very <laughs> astute, if I can say this, BS meter. Yep. You, you know what I mean? Like, I do know what you mean. They go like, I don't like hidden agendas. So it's Put fascinating. It out there. Put it out there. Put your cards on the table and then mm -hmm. let's talk about what we're yep. going to do. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's fascinating knowing Mary for so long. I've I stopped trying to guess which of the good people or which of the bad people. I just bring them in. I let Mary meet them. And I'm like, what do you think? And whatever she says, I've learned to just go, okay, well, that's it. Yeah. They don't present that way to me, but okay, if you say that. That's that is now gospel. Like, okay, so you just, your ability to yes, smell and it. you just highlighted something wonderful. If you really know the enneagram and you're working on teams, you learn to rely on other people for what you know is their superpower. If I need research done, I'm not going to Mary. No. Mary hates detail. She wants to see the big picture. Yes, I and do. Make decisions. Mm -hmm. You, on the other hand, will go lock yourself in the office, and if you're not very healthy, research too long. For sure. Before making a decision. Yeah. So if you rely on Mary to make big decisions, when she comes in the office, what's the research say? Blank. Okay, we're doing this. Yep. That discernment, that yes. parsing it out and going, this is yes. where we're going. Yeah. Yeah. Let's finish with nines. Yeah, the, for, the yep. peacemakers. For sure. uh, pleasant, laid back, accommodating, go with the flow, don't upset the apple cart types. They're motivated by a need to keep the peace to merge with larger personalities and to avoid mm -hmm. conflict at all costs. They're lovely people when they're healthy, as is true with all the Enneagram. But when they're not, peacemakers can blend into the wallpaper and not assert themselves because they don't really believe at some level that their presence really matters. Is this where you see almost that idea of martyrdom? I've, or do you see, is that more of a two trait? Mm, Great question. question. By the way, twos and nines often get confused with each other because they present so usually so cheerfully, so openly, so supportively. But the motivation is different. So the unconscious mm. motivation, this is why it's so important, right? Because there's overlap, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, sixes almost feel like that loyalist that I'm giving almost, but I guess different. They are. Uh, the difference is, is that some sixes will be ingratiating toward an authority figure. Why? Because they believe that the authority oh. figure is the key to their safety and security. Got it. A two will do it in order to win your appreciation. A nine will do it because they tend to merge with larger personalities. And so do you see where I'm going? And so mm -hmm. It's interesting. The Enneagram is simple to learn, but it's hard to master. Because you can see the same behavior. It's the motivation that mm -hmm. is That's different. That's driving it. Right. Exactly right. And I can't wait to speak with you all about how this knowledge impacts the way people think about finances, about wealth building, about making decisions uh, about the present and the future, about risk. Right. How do they handle uncertainty? I think this is going to be a fascinating yeah, conversation. <laughs> yeah, we're very much looking forward to it. Um, if people want to figure out their Enneagram type, where should they go? Great question. We have on our website, which is Ian Morgan Cron, I-A-N-M-O-R-G-A-N-C-R-O-N dot com, 
a test called the IEQ-9, which will give you an individual report about your personality type. It'll identify it and then give you a report anywhere between a 22 and a 44 page report. So it's yeah. not, you know, like here's your type in one paragraph. It's no, it goes it's deep. It's, it's deep. deep. Yeah. It's an amazing report. Yeah. And then we also have a couple's report that'll identify what you and your partner are like in relationship, how you can improve it. You know, what's it like? Uh, like what are the pitfalls and the opportunities? So both of those are on our website. Yeah. And if they want resources where they can maybe go a little bit deeper what do you recommend? Where should they start if they're starting to read? I would start I, at the risk of sounding too self-promotional. The road back. I, I to, asked for a reason. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, there are tons of great books on the Enneagram out there, content rich, but they tend to be 500 pages and a mm -hmm. little technical and dry. I love them, but, you know, I'm a nerd for this stuff. The, the road back to you is a primer. Uh, it's an entertaining read without being superficial. It gives you enough information about yeah. each type. And some people learn narratively. They're just better at reading. If you are a visual learner, you can, for example, we have a, a, a course, a video course on our website called uh, Discovering You. Oh. And that's uh, another opportunity for people to learn about their type. And that's fun because you can watch it with a group or with your partner. And if you have a partner who's not a reader, you say, oh, let's just watch this one tonight. It's only 20 minutes and we'll do right. 20 minutes from time to time. I think that's yeah. great. I, the road back to you was how I discovered you. I can't remember who recommended that. Probably you read it and told me to read it. Yeah. But I, I, I loved it. Oh, great. It was so easy just to go in and read and understand the different types and even to just pull out the type that I thought described my husband and say, here, you just read this chapter. Just right. read this chapter and we'll talk right. about it. And right. it, it has a workbook, too. Uh, yes, it does. Yeah. 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 And the story of you, the new one, and I don't remember when it came out. It, it was probably years ago, and I'm just not getting December. it. December. Oh, okay. So it's fairly new still. But that one has a workbook as well, and I'm finding that to be super useful. Great. Just to work through that process. Great. But those are both I'm good. so glad. I'm so excited. This is episode one out of nine, so I can't wait to dive into the rest. Thank you so much for being here with yeah. us yeah, today. Thank you We're so absolutely much. loving this. Eric, if they're looking for you, where can they find you? Yeah, Economics with Eric on Instagram and Facebook. And you can find me at The Wealth Woman wherever you social media. We'll see you next time. Thanks.